Good morning, lovely half faces of grace. <laughs> I just was thinking, it's so nice to see the faces of those who we haven't seen for a while, and then I thought, well, I can't see your faces. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. So welcome, welcome, welcome to this time of worship at Grace. Welcome to those of you who are in your living rooms as well. We are so glad that you have tuned in to join us today. A couple of, uh, well, just one announcement really. Next Sunday, following this worship service, will be a meeting of our shepherds for our Hebrews 1025 groups. And so I uh, just want you to know we're still working on that. Those small groups have been a real blessing to those who are participating in them. If you would like to participate, all you've got to do is just let me know. Uh, we have one going on, and there are several that are meeting. And what I hear is um, that it's just a sweet time of really being able to support and encourage one another in faith and to go a little bit deeper in our understanding of the word that was preached on Sunday morning. It's not a Bible study. You don't have to prepare for it. You just need to watch worship or be participating in the, in the worship service and come ready to share with brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, that's it, and it's really rich and wonderful. So if you'd like to be a part, just let me know. Shepherds, mark your calendar for a meeting together next Sunday after worship. Pardon me? Yes, we will share in Holy Communion next Sunday following worship, immediately following worship, and then we'll have our shepherds meeting. All right. Well, let's uh, let everyone know we're glad they're here. Smile and wave and, and uh, welcome one another to worship this morning. And... Now we'll prepare our hearts to worship the Lord as the choir sings the introit.
you stand with us and join us in the call to worship that you'll find on the screen? It'll be responsive as always. God wants his people to know the best of life. To live a life that is full, to build, plant, and multiply. We enter into worship today with hope in our hearts. For what happens here empowers us to live as God desires. God has made a promise of faithfulness to us. And in Jesus Christ, we can trust his promise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Lord. Let's uh, continue standing as you're able, and we'll sing together our hymn of praise, Victory in Jesus. Let's sing it with gusto. that so well so well uh, we're going to bow before the Lord together in prayer we're going to continue in that attitude of worship uh, just want to lift up a couple of things you may be seated sorry about that uh, we had a couple of deaths this past weekend and so just keep these two families in your prayers uh, the family of Vernie Barnett and the family of Barb Edwards they both passed away last weekend also want to lift up Alice Weedrick. Alice took a spill on Thursday and she's uh, in the hospital right now so um, 
just be in prayer for her for her full recovery and, and comfort and peace while she's there in the hospital. Let's come before the Lord together in prayer and we'll have a responsive prayer on the screen for you. Take this time to be in personal prayer. O Lord, see us as we bow before you, acknowledging with unity of heart our need for you, and knowing that no day passes that does not prove us guilty in your sight. Forgive us for prayers uttered from prayerless hearts, for praise given with praiseless sound. Our best service, we know, is tainted with the stain of our sin. All things in us call for our rejection. Yet all things in you, our God, plead for our acceptance. Therefore, we appeal from the throne of perfect justice to your throne of boundless grace. Have mercy on us. Though we are guilty, you have pardoned us. Though we are often lost, you have saved us. Though we wander, you come seeking and finding. Though we sin, you still cleanse and fill us with your spirit. Give us perpetual brokenheartedness before you, Lord Jesus. Keep us clinging ever to your cross. Flood us every moment with descending grace. Help us till up our fallow ground. And receive the springs of divine knowledge, wisdom, and refreshment, sparkling like crystal flowing clear through the wilderness of our life. Then let us be for others the refreshment and encouragement of Christ. In, in his, his name, name we, we pray, pray as, as he, he taught, taught us. Our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Will you stand with us as you are able and we'll sing our hymn of preparation, Jesus Calls Us. Let's sing together. standing, we'll hear the word of the Lord this morning from Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. If you, Israel, will return, then return to me, declares the Lord. If you put your detestable idols out of my sight and no longer go astray, and if in a truthful, just, and righteous way you swear, as surely as the Lord lives, then the nations will invoke blessings by him, and in him they will boast. This is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and to Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed ground, and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you people of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or my wrath will flare up and burn like fire because of the evil you have done, burn with no one to quench it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. So um, I, thought about, I thought about having Bill Moore fire up a rototiller and bring it right down the center aisle this morning, but I thought that might be a little bit overdoing it, so instead I'm gonna just take this hoe here and I'm gonna move it here so we can see it, just to remind us that we're focused on tilling up the ground, breaking up the clods of dirt, and getting it prepared for the, for the seed. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, our hearts are open before you, we desire to know you more fully and to experience your love in this place. Pour out your grace upon us. Pour out your love in this place. Fill us with the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. Take the words that I speak and use them as words of grace. Use them as words of mercy. Use them as words of love and compassion that will draw each of us into your presence, into the depth of who you are into new life in Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So in 1838, a revolutionary event happened not too far north of here in beautiful downtown Grand Detour, Illinois, where the Rock River takes a funny little twist. It's generally heading in a southwest direction, but it takes a little twist and it turns and it goes north. And Grand Detour sits right there on the banks of the Rock River at that point. 
This revolutionary event altered forever what had been an 8,000 year practice. A blacksmith from Vermont moved to Grand, Deta Decatur, uh, Grand, Decatur, Grand Detour to find work, and shortly after arriving, he found a discarded piece of steel that somebody had tried to use to break up the sod, the tough prairie grass that had covered much of the area. He took this piece of steel into his shop, and he reshaped it, and he polished it, and he sold it to a local farmer as the first commercially created steel plow. And the wooden plow that had served humanity for millennia was left in the dust, quite literally, as the word got out around about this new steel plow that could easily cut through the crust of the prairie. And because of its shape, and because of the fact that it was polished the way it was, wouldn't become clogged by the Midwestern clay. Now, a lot of you have already guessed by this point that blacksmith was John Deere. And by the mid-1850s, his company was producing over 10,000 plows a year. And now, of course, that, those familiar colors, the green and yellow colors, and that leaping deer symbol in all its different configurations are known around the globe. So John Deere used his ingenuity and this discarded piece of steel to create what opened up access to some of the richest soil in the entire world world. And as we know in this county and in many counties around, the crops that come from this soil, from this very rich soil, are now used to feed people literally around the world. But in order to be accessible for planting, the soil needed to be plowed up first. As we continue with our Gardening for Growth sermon series during Lent, let's not forget the, the hoped for end. And that is that the seed of the gospel would be planted in each of us so that we would know for sure and be certain about our faith and trust in Christ. And on top of that, our hope is that that which is planted in us will reproduce itself in the lives of others as we share the good news of, of Christ so that the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 13 comes true. His hope was that when the seed of the gospel is planted in us, each of us would reproduce 30 or 60 or 100 times over what had been produced in us. So, what farmers have known for thousands of years, what they discovered even with that old, those old wooden plows, is that the soil must be tilled to be most productive. The soil must be tilled to be most productive. Now, it's not just the literal soil, the, the earth, soil of the earth that has a hard casing on it, but even the soil of our souls can be hardened against the work that God wants to do in us as he plants his seed. And we have to be tilled as well. Jeremiah recognized that. He, said, he saw the hardness of the, of the hearts of those in God's people. And that happened hundreds of years before Jesus Christ ever walked the earth and hundreds of years before Jesus ever told the parable of the soils. Last week, Beth preached on King Asa and the reformation that he brought in the southern kingdom of Judah by getting rid of idols that people were worshiping. And although Jeremiah came on the scene about 240 years later, and although the nation of Judah had had a few high points in terms of its, of its uh, spiritual life, there had been several kings that had, that had done right by the Lord and uh, had served him. For the most part, it was a downward spiral of sp uh, the spiritual condition of the people just continued in this downward spiral. Jeremiah was called by God to speak on God's behalf to Judah again. And up into, uh, and through the time when they would eventually be led away into captivity in Babylon in 586 BC. The Lord had a lot to say through Jeremiah. In terms of word count, that is in terms of the number of words in the Hebrew language, it is the longest book in the Bible. It's easy to feel sorry for Jeremiah, who was called by God to hold God's people accountable with a straightforward denunciation of Judah's sins. 
The voice of judgment said that there, unless there was repentance and a return to the Lord, destruction was coming. It was inevitable unless there was a change. And that's exactly what happened as the armies of Babylon marched into, into Judah and took God's people into captivity in what is known as the exile. Jeremiah is sometimes called the weeping prophet because of the anguish of his spirit he didn't seem to have a lot of friends because of the burden of the prophecy that he was called by God to carry. Well, early on in his written prophecy, here in, in Jeremiah chapter 4, um, verses 1 through 4, we really get sort of the lay of the land here. And the simple option was laid out for the people. Return to the Lord and live, or turn away from the Lord and die can't get much simpler than that, can you? Return to the Lord and live, or turn away from the Lord and die. And the imagery that Jeremiah used to describe the condition of God's people was that they were hard-hearted. They were not willing to really listen and to respond in obedience. Like the uncultivated Midwestern soil that John Deere's plow needed to cut through, Jeremiah said, God's people, you are you are hard-hearted, you are uncultivated spiritually. They needed a plow applied to them. And he used two images to describe that. Both of them involved cutting, if you'll notice that. In, in verse 3, he talked about plowing, and in verse 4, he talked about circumcision. Beth talked last week about getting rid of the rocks, those uh, out of our lives, those idols in our lives. We've sung about that uh, already this morning. Those, li uh, those idols that usurp God's rightful place, he, he ought to be Lord over our lives. He ought to have control of our lives. And yet there are things that seem to get in the way. Well, the next step after getting rid of the rocks is to till up the soil. I'm sure some of you have been to those places around our country and maybe other countries as well that have stone fences around the edge of fields that were created by farmers a long time ago that were getting ready to till up rocky soil. We saw them again last fall when we were in Door County, Wisconsin, which of course has really rocky soil and therefore is a hard place to grow row crops. But sure enough, there they were, uh, the lichens covered stone fences all the way around fields that remind us that a long time ago, someone worked really, really hard to move all those rocks and then to prepare the soil by tilling it up so that they could plant the fields as best they could. Soil must be tilled to be productive. We know how a plow can turn over the soil for a farmer, but what does God use to prepare his people to receive the seed of the gospel? What is our plow? Well, our plow has two parts. The plow for the soil of our souls has two parts. It is repentance and obedience. Those two parts work together to plow up our soils. How God chooses to do that is, is recounted endless times in the scripture, over and over and over again. Jeremiah 4, 1 through 4 is one of those countless places where God's call to repentance and obedience is spelled out. Verses 1 and 2 call God's people, including us, to return to him and to do what he asks. We're to set aside those idols in our lives. And Beth explained that beautifully in great detail last week. But then we're to obey. You got to find those words there. It's, he said that we're to live truthfully and in a just fashion and in a righteous way. We are to obey God. Out of love for God, in response to his great love for us, especially the love he's shown to us through Jesus Christ, we turn away from sin. We turn towards God. We seek to do what he wants us to do. Now, how's that for a perfect Lenten message for us? Love God, God so much, love him so much that we repent of our sin and we turn and obey him. Demonstrate your loyalty to the Lord in righteous living. If we do, verse says, 2 says, there'll be great blessing. Of course, we'll be blessed, but we'll also be a means by which blessing comes to other people and to other nations. And they will in turn give God the glory that he deserves. Jeremiah, in, in a lot of ways, uh, was, was a prophet of doom. Um, 
but he also spoke words of hope in the midst of judgment. And that's not un at all uncommon in, in prophetic writings. In the midst of the challenging parts, there's always these little, there's these little spots uh, of, they're, they're, like, they're like springs of water in the desert that, that are just springing up and they're bringing refreshment in the midst of all of this, all of the, uh, of the difficult parts, the challenging parts that are mentioned. And here it is in Jeremiah 4, 1 through 4, in the midst of all these warnings about what's going to happen if you forsake the Lord, what's going to happen, the devastating consequences that are coming, there's a wonderful, wonderful, simple invitation to return to the Lord. Come on back to me, says the Lord. Come on back to me. His terms, which by the way, are different than our terms oftentimes, the invitation is based upon his terms, and his terms including breaking up the unplowed ground in each of our hearts so that we can become productive spots for his seed to be planted in us and to grow uh, meaningful lives according to his will. Well, tilling the soil of our souls describes God's work in us when we repent and obey. But how does that tilling ha help us repent and obey? How does tilling up the soil of our lives help us repent and obey? Well, let's, let's just use uh, what would happen in, in, a, in a farm situation. First of all, tilling gets rid of the old growth that is no longer productive. Tilling gets rid of the old growth that is no longer productive. We see that all the time around here, don't we? The ground gets turned over, the, the debris and things left from previous years are plowed under, disked under. Even low-till fields have some disking that goes on. When we use the two-part plow of repentance and obedience in our relationship with, with the Lord, we plow under the old stuff that's been hanging on our spirits and it's no longer useful and productive. We leave behind the old stuff as God allows a, a, uh, us to do a new thing in the, his power and presence in our lives. So let's let the Lord speak to us through Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. And this is what Isaiah 40, 43, 18 and 19 says, forget the former things, don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing, says the Lord. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? The old, the old debris is gone. The Lord does the tilling in us. Secondly, tilling reduces competition from encroachers. Farmers want all the nutrients in the soil to be used for crop production, not for weeds that pull the good stuff away from the crops that are being produced. Jeremiah said it, he said, don't plant among the thorns. Don't allow the encroachers to come in. We'll have an entire message later in this series on weeding, so I'm not going to say anything more about it than this. Our spirits also need a plow or hoe applied in order to get rid of the competitors that keep us from the main thing, keep the main thing from being the main thing. And the main thing is our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Third, tilling frees up the soil to receive the good stuff. Until the crust is broken through, seed will not put down deep roots, nor will water do what it's supposed to. It won't be most effective as penetrating, uh, penetrating the soil. Just think about, think about your own yard. Think about the grass in your own yard. Think about trying to plant a garden without ever turning the ground over. If you took seed out there and, and just cast it around, there might be a few few little stubbly things that would come up, but the seed wouldn't penetrate. The very first rain that comes would wash most of the seed away. Turning away from sin and learning to obey God opens our hearts to receive the good stuff, all the good stuff God wants to give us, the abundant life Jesus promised to his followers. When our hearts are tender and receptive, God can do his very best work in us by the movement and activity of his Holy Spirit. And, and this, is the way I, this is the way I think about it. The callousness of a hard heart is gone when it's tilled up. We need to be really careful here not to think that God loves us more because we're obeying him. He loves us because he loves us. He loves us in spite of ourselves sometimes. No earning our salvation wings here. Rather, we repent and we obey because we have experienced God's love. 
we have had his love pour into our lives to such a degree that we want to love him in return. We want to do what he says. We want to do what he wants us to do. When we return to the Lord and make him the highest priority, God breaks up and he breaks down the hard places in our spirits that have kept us from fully receiving the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hard-heartedness, that callousness that we get in our lives does harm to our spirits and it keeps the divine seed planter at bay. What is produced in our garden is worthless at best and harmful at worst. There's a vast difference between perfunctory repentance and heartfelt return and restoration in the Lord. And so we pray, oh Lord, please have your way in me. Break down my unplowed ground, I pray pray. I trust you to plant your seed in my life as I return to you with all of my heart. Well, in order to apply the plow to the soil of our, uh, the soil of our souls, we must identify and name our unplowed grounds. In other words, we've got to figure out, so, so where does the plow need to be applied in our lives? What's, what's my unplowed ground? What's my callous places that need to be broken up? Now this is not an exhaustive list, but I'm hoping that those of you in Hebrews 10.25 groups will be able to add to that list as, as uh, we meet to talk about, about this message. But at least this is the starting point. This is priming the pump for us. And so I'm gonna name six particular sort of uh, versions or forms of, of uh, unplowed ground. First of all, there are old habits and temptations old habits and temptations. Now, which of us doesn't have those? Those old habits and temptations, they have become so normal to us that we never give it a thought to the harm that they're doing or the way that they've placed a hardened callus on our souls. We repeat the same sin over and over. We repeat the same habit. We give in to the temptation again and again and again until we give, got to the point where, where we just give up and we say, never mind, I'm not going to deal with that. Um, I, it's, it'll never be out of my life anyway. And what happens is we become desensitized by our repetitive sin. Lustful thoughts or hateful thoughts or words or actions have become just the norm for us. And, and we deal with addictions, addictions that we've rationalized or we've just learned to, to live with, and they, but they, yet they continue to hound us. That is unplowed ground that needs the application of God's plow. Second, old ways of thinking that we're reluctant to give up. We've reached a point of resignation and given up by saying, this is just the way I am. I can't do anything about it. Or worse yet, this is just the way God made me. That is, we put the blame for our own sin back upon God. That is a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. Some who have never really given the Christian faith a fair shake as a legitimate option in their lives use their upbringing as an excuse not to take a closer look at new life offered in Christ. They might say things like, well, it was, my parents didn't need it, it wasn't any good for them, or I was brought up thinking that the Christian faith is a fairy tale, or I, knew, I never knew about or needed the Christian faith back then, why in the world would I need it now? There's nothing in my, going on in my life right now that's going to change my mind. Being stuck in that old way of thinking needs a plow. I hope none of us, no matter what our age, are, are ever closed off to new possibilities, including the possibility of new life in Christ. It could be that something that we've never considered or we've poo-pooed or we've ignored could be the very thing that would turn life around for us and give us new meaning and purpose. Third, negative outlook. This is where gloomy Gus and negative Nelly show up. They fit into this slot. We ignore the words of Jesus in Matthew 6.34 and we assume the worst. We, we worry about everything that comes along. We borrow trouble before it ever has a possibility and we worry about every contingency and every what if as it comes along. This is an area I've faced at times in my life 
And so if you find yourself there too, then let's agree together that we need the, that unplowed, unplowed ground broken up so that God can plant something much better in us, trusting him more fully in the complexities of life. Fourth, unplowed ground, dependence upon what is temporary. But we've talked about that enough that there ought to be, that ought to be clear as a bell in your minds. As recently as last Sunday, Beth preached about idols that are temporary that we put in God's place. Much of what we think is so important will pass away and be gone. If we're continuing to put our hope in what is here today but could or will be gone tomorrow, then we need to apply the plow. We need to make the soil of our hearts receptive to the seed of new and eternal life in Christ. Another form of hard ground, self-protection. Self-protection. Some of us have been hurt in the past, and I don't ever want to downplay that, but we've been hurt, and we've never really bounced back from that. We've never really come out of that. We've developed a shell of protection. We've become defensive about letting anyone else into our lives because we're afraid we'll be hurt again. That shell has only gotten harder over the years to the point where it's not only impervious, but it's also very, very heavy. We carry it around with us. Today could be the day to allow the Lord to break up that shell and let some new, fresh new life and the love of others into your life that could make all the difference for the rest of your life. Sixth, stubborn self-will. For some of us, our unplowed ground is our self-sufficiency. We're convinced we know what's best for us, and there's nobody else that does, and nobody else can tell us. We know. In our mind, there's no court question about the course of our lives, and there's nobody else but ourselves that ought to tell us the direction we ought to go. I've got this. That's our mantra. I've got this. A question for you if this is your unplowed ground. Do you really believe that you know better than the one who created you? He's the same one who sees everything. He knows everything about the trajectory of your life. He knows everything about your future, everything that's coming. As a matter of fact, the future of everything that is, is in his hands. Your future is in his hands. Could it be that he has some seed he'd like to plant in you? He can't until the soil of your soul is tilled up and prepared. The idea of plowing up our ground is a wonderful Lenten discipline for all of us. So can I Can I plant this idea in your mind? Lenten disciplines over the years can make a huge difference in who, by God's grace, we become. Lenten disciplines over the years can make a huge difference in who, by God's grace, we become. Here's the truth. At some point down the road, who knows, maybe five years from now, maybe 10 years, maybe 20, 30, longer, you're going to meet an old man or an old woman. And that old man or old woman is going to be you. Some of you may be saying, I've already met that old man. I've already met that old woman. But the question is, what kind of person will that be? Will that person, will that person, will that man or woman be seasoned, gentle, gracious, generous, giving, loving? Will that person have grown old gracefully, surrounded by family who loves them and appreciates them, and friends who know that they are a blessing, that know that they still are a blessing? Or will that person be bitter, disillusioned, calloused, self-centered, soured on life, lacking in strong friendships, suffering from broken family relationships. That would be a person with a crust, what we would call a crusty person. You see, you become a composite of everything that you do, think, and say, even now, starting right now. Who you will become is a result of lots and lots and lots of decisions, just like today in the decision that you need to make.
you have to decide, am I going to live with my hardened soil, the soil in my soul hardened, and leave the Lord on the outside looking in? Or am I going to apply the rototiller or the spade or the hoe or the plow and get busy preparing the soil of my life to receive the very best life that God has to give me? I hope for your sake, I hope for the sake of your family, I hope for the sake of our church, for the sake of your friendships, that you will do all you can to prepare the soil of your souls for everything that God so, is so lovingly desperate to plant in us. Interestingly enough, Jeremiah 1.3 could well be a quote of an earlier prophet, Hosea. Hosea, in chapter 10, verse 12, says this, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. It is time to seek the Lord. Now is the time to seek the Lord. Now is the time to break up your unplowed ground. Now is the time to become fruitful and productive for the kingdom. It is time. It is time right now. Don't let this time go by. Don't let this very time, this very day, this very moment pass you by. God has something wonderful that he wants to do in your life if we will just simply allow him to do that. Let us pray. Holy and loving Lord, may none of us miss the multiple opportunities you present for us to receive new life in Christ, including this moment today. May each one who is hearing this message from you today respond by giving you the clearance and the freedom to break up the hardness of our hearts so that we become soft and pliable and receptive to your love and grace. Prepare us for planting for a great harvest, loving Lord. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We make our response to the word we've just heard by the giving of our lives and our offerings before the Lord. We want to remind you that there are baskets at the back for your offering here in the sanctuary. You're welcome to give online or uh, through the postal service. There are lots of ways for you to contribute to the life of Christ here at Grace United Methodist Church. So hear the invitation to our giving this morning from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we've been talking about gardening for growth. I hope that, that you are hearing a recurring theme throughout these messages that our salvation is not about a moment in time when we confess Jesus as Lord. It is about a life lived trusting Jesus every single day and expressing that trust in living obediently, doing what he says, living in his way so that those seeds of abundant life can be ours. They can be planted in our hearts and flourishing in our lives by his design. If we do these things, writes Peter, then we will experience that life in Christ that is ours for the taking. It's there, it's a gift. God does the work. One of those practices commanded by our God is to be generous in giving to his purposes to come into his house every week, expressing our desire to live in God's way as we bring to him our tithes and our offerings and lay our lives before him once again. So let's put our faith into practice today. Let's lay down our gifts and our lives before him in these moments, and in just a few moments, we'll pray a prayer of dedication over those gifts. Oh, so, yes, wait, can you hold that one second? So, on, sorry, thank you. On Ash Wednesday, we had 
what did we have, about 25 kids here. They were all in the front row, and uh, they participated in the service. If you didn't watch it online, um, they sang the salvation poem for us that night. Uh, and so we have that video for you as our offertory anthem. Enjoy. Yes, yes. Perfect Lenten song, right? Change my life and make me new and help me live for you. Will you bow in prayer with me? Oh, thank you, Father, that you have shown us the way to experience life in Christ here and now, to turn around, to return to you. You have given us clear instructions and you have made the invitation to all who will trust in you. We trust you, Lord with all that we are and all that we have. We seek to obey you in laying our lives and our gifts before you. And we pray that we may live in this life as those who reveal your will and your way to this world so that others may know you, may turn to you, may live in obedience and trust. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand with me as you are able and we'll sing our hymn of commitment, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed?
well, we're going to we're going to send one another with a benediction. We're going to sing. I think we have the words, do we? Have the words for this? We yes, we're, here we go. Let's let's send one another out in the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace of God the Father and the love. in his confidence and his grace. May his peace be upon you all. Amen.